Hey, hey, kids, we're a couple of annoyed grunt boys, and this is the 138 Simpsons Podcast. That's right, we're the podcast that explores the American animated sitcom The Simpsons from seasons 11 and beyond, and the newest ones when they're available. Why do we do it like this? Well, plenty of other podcasts explore the golden age of Simpsons, that being seasons 1 through 10, and an entity known as the Wheel of Random has trapped us and forced us to watch things in such a manner. I say we because I'm one annoyed grunt boy named Steve, and with me, as always, is the other annoyed grunt boy... Mr. Black. Your last name is Black? My name is Craig. That wasn't my voice. Ah, so confused. Steve, how are you, uh, how are you hosting this episode this week? Well, Craig, I think we'd keep things, you know, tight and structured. Much like my sex life. Exactly. So I want you to name your top three sexual partners, top three candy bars, and uh, top three Andy McDowell movies in that order. Uh, well, it's all the same answer, Steve. Multiplicity. Ah, yes. That is a good movie. I know that people like Michael Keaton. I don't think he gets the respect he deserves. There's a new movie that I kind of want to watch that uh, he directed. It's called like Knox Goes to Town or something. Mm-hmm. I think it just came out on uh, uh, Knox Goes Away. This is a 2023 film, but I just keep seeing ads for like uh, uh, for um, you know not 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 theater movie, but what is it called? Uh, direct to like just direct video or direct. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not streaming. You have to pay for it. Oh, okay, like, like, VOD. Video VOD. Content. Yeah, but look, it's got uh, it's got James Marsden in it. Oh, he's fun. It's got Marcia Gay Harden and a one Al Pacino. Oh, wow. Uh, it said it came out uh, in September 2023 at TIFF, hmm. Toronto International Film Festival, in the U.S. Uh, March 15th, the Ides of March. So maybe it now just came out, maybe had like a small little run in the cinema. But yeah, he directed uh, directed the film. Hmm. Uh, I don't know why we're getting to uh, Michael Keaton. Yeah, Michael Keaton's great. Yeah, I think that uh, Birdman is like an underappreciated movie. I think that, you know. No, it wasn't. It was I know. It was. I actually didn't like Birdman. You didn't? No, I don't like Birdman. That's fair. Um, he's Batman. He's not Birdman. That's true. He is not Birdman. You know, Jackie Brown. He's great in Jackie Brown. She reprised yeah. that role in uh, Out of Sight. As a kid, it didn't uh, uh, grasp my mind. It's like, well, this is a Tarantino movie. And then what, what was it? Uh, a Soderbergh movie, because it was also written by uh, Elmore Leonard. So he's playing the same character. But it'd be like the equivalent of... Seen Harrison Ford, he's in Star Wars playing Han Solo, and then all of a sudden he's in Star Trek playing Han Solo. That would be very weird. I, mean, I guess George Clooney was in, because he was the star of Out of Sight, and he was in um, the other Tarantino uh, film with uh, Rodriguez. What's that one? You know, the, the, the monster things. From Dust Till Dawn? Yeah, yeah. Also the star of uh, an episode of The Simpsons. That's true. Ah, The Simpsons. They're great. Right. They are great, but before we get into our usual banter, there's so many, uh, because you haven't been all The Simpsons, there's so many movies of Michael Keaton that we could review for our uh, Patreon podcast. It's true. We could do Beetlejuice. We could do two of the Batman. Technically three, Steve, because he was in The Flash. Yeah, I, I, I think we could do Jack Frost. I mean, everyone wants to hear a podcast about Jack Frost. There's plenty of podcasts out there that have discussed Jack Frost. Maybe maybe one with uh, Jason Manzoukas. It really is one of those movies that makes you ask, how did this get made? Wow, so many things. And now now can we review podcasts that Jason Manzoukas has been on because he's been on The Simpsons in this episode? That's true. So we could review, you know, Entrepreneur's Entrepreneur show or... No one knows what we're talking about, Steve. No, no, we're in the weeds. But uh, I think we should go back in time, all the way back to April 7th, 2024. Uh, Craig, what were we watching in that uh, good old office of boxes? Everyone seems to be going to see Godzilla, Kong, the new empire. Which, it looked really silly on uh, with the trailers I saw, but it's making a lot of money. And I guess I guess it's probably what people actually wanted from all those you know new Kong and new Godzilla movies that were like slow building and, and people were just like, Let's see the monsters. And I think they actually did it and gave everyone what they wanted. And it's monsters. So I think that's why it's, why it's doing pretty well. I'm fascinated by this kind of kaiju renaissance that we're in right now. Like for the past like 10 years, I feel like there's been a lot of Godzilla and Kong movies. 
that I don't know, like, I know that there's a fan base, but it just surprised me that they're still making them. And I think that this one is finally like what, like you say, the fans are looking for where it's just big action of the, the two big monsters fighting each other. So here we are. We still have like the Toho, the people who created it over in Japan still making them. And those are always the ones that, uh, you know, the purists like, like that Godzilla minus one is supposed to be one of the best movies last year, which I haven't seen. I really want to watch it. And then there's the uh, TV show on Apple Plus or whatever. Yeah, Apple. Uh, what's that called? Monarch? Oh, yeah. Monarch, yes. Which I people would tell me about Monarch, and it took me forever to learn that it's not about butterflies, but it's about big monsters, and I didn't know. So, yeah, um, I do want to see uh, Godzilla Minus One, too. I've heard nothing but good things. So Now I'm on the uh, Rotten Tomatoes here, and the tomato review, like the quote-unquote critics, give it 54 but I always go by audience score. This one's got a whole 92 out of audience score. So I guess uh, I guess it is what uh, fans wanted. So do we go see Godzilla X Kong? I think the last one I watched was the Skull Island movie. That was maybe 12 years ago. Yeah, I think I'm in the same boat and I liked it just fine. But yeah, I don't know if we need context. I saw that. I thought be fine. The Godzilla one with Brian Cranston. Uh, and that was kind of boring because it just led up to nothing. Yeah. Anyways, that's what we were watching, Steve. Uh, next week, though, it'll probably be a different story, right? Well, yeah, because it will be. Yeah, because it'll be in November of 2000. Well, no, no one knows that. Yeah, we don't know where we'll be next week. Yeah, who knows what will be the number one movie next week, Steve? I'm going to assume it'll be, as I'm looking, the coming soon for uh, Rotten Tomatoes here. Uh, exhibition on screen, John Singer, Sergeant, Fashion and Swagger. What do you think? Will that be the number one movie next year, next week? No, no. No doubt about it. Not only next week, but all of next year. That's going to be the one movie that everybody talks about for 52 whole weeks. All right. Steve, what's everyone listening to? What's the hottest song on the radio today? Well, Craig, the number one song on the Billboard Hot 100 is Like That by Future Metro Boomin and Kendrick Lamar. Hey, that's my uh, law firm. Future Metro Boomin and Kendrick Lamar. Yeah, yeah. great. <laughs> Ah, uh, Steve, that's too sweet, that song. Yeah. Uh, hey, speaking of uh, Too Sweet, Steve, uh, what's the song, uh, The Rock Alternative? Uh, well, the number one hot rock and alternative song is Too Sweet by Hosier. He's not a one-hit wonder anymore? I guess not. He's at least a two-hit wonder. I felt like uh, Take Me to Church came out like a million years ago, and so the fact that he's back in the charts is surprising, but good for him or them. Is it a person? Is it a band? I don't know. Well, I think everyone's on bated breath to find out what the uh, country song is this week, Steve. Oh, boy. Well, believe me, my household... Your asshole. My household... Oh. ...is very familiar with this song and this album, seemingly playing it nonstop. But it's a very good album. I will say my favorite of this artist, the number one country hot 100 song is Texas Hold'em by one Beyonce. Do you feel like uh, at this point you've heard it too much and you just want uh, just want that music to disappear like uh, you're a magician? Yes, yeah, kind of like a uh, great Kreskin or a David Copperfield or maybe a Houdini. Which brings us to the number one hot dance and electric song, Houdini, by one Dua Lipa. All right. Uh, congratulations to all of you. You'll be receiving your Annoyed Grunt Boy uh, stickers in the mail. So excited, I'm sure. Dua Lipa is waiting with bated breath to get that sticker. Um, alrighty, Craig, let's get into it. Uh, this week we're talking about Night of the Living Wage, in which Marge gets a job in a high-pressure ghost kitchen. But when she tries to start a union, she gets more than she collectively bargained for. Alright, Craig, let's uh, give this a watch. We'll take a little break, and we'll be right back. <laughs> We're back. Today we're talking about Night of the Living Wage, the 14th episode of the 35th season. It originally aired on April 7th, 2024. It is episode 764 in the show's run. Your nerd code is 35ABF07. It was written by Cesar Mazariegos, directed by Chris Clements, and your showrunners are Al Jean, Matt Selman, and Rob Lezebnik. All right, Cesar, you know, writer, producer for this uh, show called The Simpsons that we talk about. 
at least once a week. He's also voiced uh, Grandpa Baby in season 32's episode, The Last Firefighter, and was the uh, rapper in the recent episode, uh, Clan of the Cavemon, Violence Gigante. He's written six episodes of The Simpsons, and uh, this is the fifth one. So the only one we haven't reviewed was his very first episode, I Corumbus, from season 32, episode two. But the other ones were the series, A Serious Flanders Part 1 and 2, Not It, yeah, Homer's Crossing, and this one, and also you wrote the uh, little uh, short for Disney Plus, When Billy Met Lisa, When Billy Eilish Met Lisa, and I'll let you know, uh, they didn't actually meet because uh, it's a cartoon. Well, yes. Did she yeah. actually meet Billy Crystal? No, no, Billy, uh, it was Billy Eilish, not Billy Crystal. Oh, so Steve. Yeah. okay. But I could see, like... Billy Eilish and Billy Crystal hanging out, you know? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good time. There's the uh, the Billy Con that happens every uh, every four years. Mm-hmm. You got uh, Billy Jean King. She shows up. Uh, yeah. Billy Joel. I, it, it's also you can spell the I-E or the Y at the end of Bill, so yeah, don't worry. Billy uh, Piper. Mm-hmm. Billy on the street himself, Billy Eichner. Yeah. Old... Slick Dick Willie, uh, Bill Clinton. Billy Clinton shows up. The good doctor. That one, Billy Cosby. He's the bartender, of course. With uh, sure. Bill, Bill Clinton probably helps him out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Bill Murray, uh, Bill Belichick. <laughs> Billy Carter. Bill Bev DeVoe. They, they, they sing. <laughs> that drink is poison. Well, especially if Bill Cosby is making them. Right. Ducks, like the animals, ducks are allowed to show up because they have duck bills. Sure. Um, uh, cops are not allowed, but their clubs are because they are billy clubs. Right. Uh, it's cash only. You only can pay with uh, bills, of course. Right. Destiny's Child is there with their bills, bills, bills. William Shatner shows up because everyone calls him Bill. You know, that's his, his name to his friends. Mm-hmm. They recite uh, Shakespeare, of course, William Shakespeare. And Billy Barty. R.I.P. So I think uh, based on the... Uh, Five of his six that we reviewed. I'm not counting this one, of course. Mm -hmm. Like Series of Flanders and Not It. Great episodes. Yeah, really good. Homer's Crossing, the first episode from uh, the season, right? We liked that Mm -hmm. one. Yeah, he becomes a crossing guard. That was fun. Uh, But will this hold up to those episodes, Steve? Or will this be uh, an A2 Brute uh, Caesars (laughs) writing credits on this uh, show that we call The Simpsons? That's right. Will we stab him in the back because of this episode? Or will it be delight like a Caesar salad? Or comedic genius Sid Caesar. And his show of shows. Like this show, The Simpsons. And let's begin this episode, Steve. Okay? Okay. It begins, as it always does, with Lisa taking Snowball 2 on a walk in a stroller. She doesn't care what Bart says. There's nothing crazy about taking your kitty out for a walk. Crazy Cat Lady couldn't agree more, saying in her own gibberish that uh, that's how she started. So Lisa and Snowball 2 arrive at Little Vest Park, where they find a menagerie of various animals and their owners, such as... The blue-haired lawyer with his weasel. We have Milhouse with his Shih Tzu, which I guess would be Puppy Goo Goo, although originally Puppy Goo Goo was a toy dog, not a real dog. And as we recently learned, he actually does have a dog, a chihuahua named Takito, so... But this is his shih tzu, whoever it is. Maybe the writers just don't know. Maybe. Uh, we got Wiggum with his pig. Fitting. Uh, Smithers with his Doberman puppy, uh, Kate Spade. Hans Mole Man with a giant tortoise. <laughs> that tracks. There's uh, a yuck. A mole? That would make sense, yes. And uh, a man. Kate. Yeah, you should have both on a leash, a mole and a man. Or some weird hybrid. Wait a minute, Steve. Are you gay for Hans Mole Man? Nobody's gay for Mole Man. Uh, we have Captain McAllister with a parrot. Jasper Beardsley with a bearded goat. Patty and Selma with Jub Jub. Helen Lovejoy with a lamb of God. Maybe. Herman Herman with a three legged bulldog. Lindsay Nagel with a chameleon. Is that because she can uh, just fit into any job? And so she's adaptable. Yeah. Yeah. And we have Truth Ann in her third appearance of the show, the first being season 34's Game Done Changed, our 201st episode. And the season finale of season 34, Homer's Adventure Through the Windshield Glass, which we discussed last May in our 225th episode. Well, Steve, Truth Ann is accompanied by her chicken, uh, Gwyneth Poultry. And uh, in this clip, uh, Lisa's going to learn what this park is all about from, of course, uh, Truth Ann. Oh, what is this place? 
This park is a paradise for emotional support animals and their caring human partners. Oh, that's lovely. Now get out! Your mangy cat can't be in here if she's unvested. Oh, but my kitty is so empathetic. She's the most caring, lovable, gentle, oh. sweet... <laughs> my anxiety chicken! <laughs> Somebody do something! I can't do things. I'm an empath. I'm conflict averse. Support me, apples. Oh, boy. I think I recently just saw a video of a lady taking her cat on the beach with a leash. And then someone's unleashed dog came up and started uh, attacking the cat. Ooh. And then it also looked like the guy was attacking the lady. I don't know. Ooh. It was very chaotic. Yeah. And also, I don't think it's... Uh, cats don't want to be on leashes, right? I mean, sure, maybe some cats do, but... Yeah, the majority don't. They're not the type that you take anywhere. And look, I'm a cat lover, Steve. As am I. And I don't have a dog and I have nothing against dogs, but I feel like... You should probably keep the the cats away from the dogs. You just don't know what's going to happen, right? I mean, it's just a lot of uh, interspecies emotions happening, and you don't, you can't predict what they're going to do. Um, it's a dog eat dog world, and dogs want to eat cats. If you've learned anything from cartoons, like we have, dogs eat cats. Yeah, and cats eat mice and chickens, and mice eat cheese, and the cheese is eaten by turtles. When the cheese is on a flat, round piece of bread with uh, some tomato sauce on it. Exactly. Weird that it's round, but it's also triangle, and it comes in a square. Pizza is the best uh, tool to uh, teach kids about shapes, right? It really is. I can't think of any food that goes through more shapes. Look, a rectangle, that's a Detroit-style pizza, right? A yeah. pan pizza, a bar pizza. Yeah. Can you make a star I pizza, could... Steve? I think you could. I mean, it would be it'd be awkward to eat, because I feel like... Too sharp? Yeah. And like the crust would be on the inside almost because you'd have, I'm imagining multiple triangles making the star. So you'd have like multiple slices. So you'd have like crust in the middle, which could work, I think. It'd just be interesting. The reverse pizza where the crust is in the middle and the uh, the insides. Hold on. Okay. Let's try that, Steve. Let's make that pizza. Alrighty. Sounds like a dumb thing that uh, Pizza Hut in the 90s would have tried. Remember the uh, like the stuffed crust pizza commercials where it was... Uh, People about to eat the pizza from the point, but they're like, they turn it around to eat the crust first. Mm hmm. Ah, uh, 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 gotta flip it around. Yeah. I think Shaq did that, right? Man, Shaq really likes pizza. She does. I mean, but then who doesn't, Steve? I mean, pizza's great. That's yeah. Pizza. Even cats and dogs like pizza. That's how we can bring the cat and dog societies together. Look, we've talked a lot about uh, support animals on this podcast. I don't think we need to get into the uh, like support chickens and stuff like that that we've seen. Right, right. I, I think we've made our positions known and uh, get what you need, don't get what you don't need, and uh, call it good. Just get a podcast. That's my support animal. Yeah. <laughs> I got my emergency uh, support microphone, and that's all I need. <laughs> so let's go to uh, Tweeters, Sinai Bird Hospital. The uh, veterinarian we first met in season three's Dog of Death tells Truth Ann and her uh, mother about the that it was a peck and go for a minute. But uh, Gwyneth Poultry is going to be all right. Hmm, I don't know if that veterinarian is on a uh, tapped out or I, I haven't seen him yet. Seems like he should be, but yeah. It could be, Steve. It's been years since I've played. And then when I logged in, <laughs> there's so many characters. Apparently Maggie Simpson. Did you, I always thought Maggie Simpson was a character, but as soon as I started playing, it's like, oh, here's a new character. Hmm. Yeah. Do you, you remember Maggie in the game, right? I don't. Yeah. Every character. Also not in this episode. <laughs> well, she... Uh, she actually was on strike. She was kind of the inspiration for this episode. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, it, it was in the trivia and the show's notes, but I thought it wasn't that uh, interesting, so I got rid of it. But now I'm telling it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it was that and uh, the she was in rehab for an opioid addiction. Yeah, it gets the youngest of us all the time. I understand. Yeah. She's the Leaf Garrett of uh, the Citizens <laughs> cast. She's going to show up in a park one day and uh, meet Gerald, the one <laughs> the unibrow baby, and apologize. Yeah. Well, uh, he has him an astronomical bill. Uh, Homer's shocked to learn he'll have to pay $16,000 for a chicken, especially since he just ate a whole bucket of KFC. No, not that kind. A, no. a crusty fried chicken for 20 bucks. And the uh, little bucket says, uh, now with more talons. Yum, yum. I think 20 is $20. I think that's pretty good price. I, I feel like the last time I got like a bucket of chicken was like 
$34. But wow. I think I got like, you know, two sides with it. Mm-hmm. You're not a, you're, you're not a KFC. You're more of a Popeyes, right? That is true. I am a Popeyes uh, fan. I think it's a better taste and just more consistent, but that's just me. I mean, I, I, I think that um, in years, in recent years, uh, KFC has fallen off a little bit. I tried them every now and then, and it just doesn't hit the way it used to. Yeah, I, I'm the same. Uh, Popeyes I prefer, but I'll eat the KFC. I feel like one sides are better. Like is, no, Popeyes has the better sides, right? Yeah, I mean, their um, mashed potatoes is very good. Mac and cheese is very good. I like their Cajun fries, although I could understand how somebody wouldn't because usually when you get them, they're kind of not as crispy as you want them to be, but they still have a good flavor because they got that little bit of Cajun spice to them. Well, you have to eat them like in your car or in the store. Exactly, yeah. But is it between like the biscuits? Like who has a better biscuit, KFC or Popeyes? This is something I've thought far too much about. KFC has a decent biscuit that is consistent. Popeyes has either the best biscuit you've ever had or a hockey puck covered in butter that will make you suffocate. Their hit or miss ratio on biscuits alone is so high that you never know what you're going to get. It can be either delicious or a nightmare. But I think the KFC chicken, especially the extra crispy, which is never extra crispy because when you get delivered, it's soggy. (laughs) Right. Ah. I feel like chicken tonight, Steve. Like chicken tonight. I feel like chicken tonight. Steve, so did you find a price on a, a bucket of chicken? Yeah, so in our area, an eight-piece bucket of chicken only, no sides. We're talking twenty four ninety nine. Wow, that's for eight pieces? Yeah, and then it goes higher for 12 or 16. Because it used to be like 15 bucks, you got like a 12-piece and then like two sides, and like that would feed the family. I always remember like a bucket of chicken alone costing around $10 and then, yeah, the additional sides. But yeah, so if you're looking at a 16-piece bucket, you're spending $43. Whoa. That's when you just decide to uh, just go to the store, buy a chicken yourself, and learn how to fry it, right? Mm-hmm. Or you could buy two rotisserie chickens for like 6 bucks a piece. Yeah, go to the Costco. Get your mm-hmm. rotisserie chicken and a hot dog. I love the hot dog. Steve, have I got great. a meter for you. Oh, boy. Uh, Speaking of body parts, uh, there are a number of procedures that the chicken will have to undergo in their body parts, such as a prosthetic beak, a cochlear implant, and Bach therapy. Marge is concerned about how to pay for all of this, but uh, when the pathetic hen is rolled out in a wheelchair covered in bandages, the whole family balks with empathy. Then Marge has an idea. They say all it takes to financially ruin a family is one unexpected medical bill. Who knew ours would be for jacking up some bougie-ass chicken? <laughs> I am so sorry. You can sell my Malibu Stacy dream house. It's increased in value. I just redid the kitchen. Relax. We're not going to sell your toys. The sex is where the real money is. Homer. What? My upper, lower, middle, lower, lower class income isn't going to get us out of this. Hmm. In order to save this family, I'm going to have to do something I've never done before. Get a job. Oh, you've had tons of jobs. Cop, realtor, gym owner, erotic baker, weed sommelier. Those were for my own growth. This time, it's not personal. Is there any more jobs that uh, you can think of that Marge had? Because these are the ones I can think of, the ones that Bart lists. She was the small business owner when she had the pretzel company. Oh, wait, how can I forget that? As she painted Mr. Burns' as I count, that's more of a uh, freelance type of gig. There was also that time when she, like, did home repairs, but, like, Homer took the credit, or, like, because it Homer, hired yeah, him. right. But I guess that would count as a job. Didn't she, like, uh, eat food with Bart? Was that a job? Or I think that... so. No, she didn't, like, review restaurants or anything. She blogged why, about it? Why do I remember her being a teacher for a day? Like... Yeah, because uh, remember Bart had to stop the uh, log from bashing her head? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's not the PT disbands. It's the... No, but yeah, there is one where... Well, the, the teachers are on strike. Doesn't Ned become the teacher, or do they both become teachers? Man, well, you know, the problem is, we should know this because they're classic episodes, but we're not allowed to watch those episodes. Exactly. Yeah, see, 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 fans, we're, we're, we're smart. We're not idiots, we're not dumb. Yeah, we know things. Important things about The Simpsons. Now, we talk a lot about joke jail. Homer saying upper, lower, middle class. I don't know what the opposite of jail is aside from freedom, but 
that joke always makes me laugh. Being upper, lower, middle, lower class income, like that always gives a chuckle out of me. And so I, I just want to say that's a get out of jail card for Homer. Yeah, no, no one's denying that it's not funny. No, no, I'm just saying. I enjoy it. Okay. <laughs> well, Marge, Bart, and Lisa, check out uh, gigjunkie.com. Steve, is that a real website? No, but Junkie Gig is. It's a place for heroin addicts to find uh, music gigs. Oh, cool. Uh, so for possible jobs, right? Uh, for Marge, like uh, bolt gun operator, grave robber's apprentice, uh, rideshare driver. That was really funny, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, shoe shiner and fight club referee. Lisa points out that they are hiring cooks. And uh, Marge remarks that cooking is one of the few things that she doesn't doubt about herself. They are looking for team players at Kimmy Chow, which, as Bart explains, is the new uh, food delivery app. The teachers at Springfield Elementary have been using it ever since Lunch Lady Dora was on Cafeteria Nightmares. Just then on screen, an ad pops up uh, with Gordon Ramsay saying, Cafeteria Nightmares, every night, forever, on Fox. Because reality is all we got. I've kind of, like, phased out of a lot of the cooking shows. Like, I'm just, like, especially those, like, Fox ones. Mm-hmm. Like now there's like the level and what I get from it. Never watched it, but from the commercials I see, it's just with some of the Gordon hosts. But it's like I start a dish and then in a time limit it's not done. It, it goes up a level and then someone has to finish that. <laughs> oh, weird. It's just this. It's just silly. That sounds goofy. And I think I kind of like, uh, you know, I'm not saying respected Gordon Ramsay. You know, I'd watch the old Kitchen Nightmares, all that stuff. But like, but when you see like Frozen tv dinners with his face on it really they can't be that good like there's never been a frozen tv dinner meal that's been like better than home cooked or going to a restaurant like so when you're this chef that's like so known for like cooking amazing meals i don't trust something that here's my beef wellington bites you can get for 4.99 your freezer section yeah i i completely agree like i don't want to like rank Celebrity chefs, but like, I think that, you know, Guy Fieri having frozen food kind of makes sense because it's kind of like in his wheelhouse. No, I agree. Like, if it's Guy Fieri, I'm like, yeah, I'm totally getting that. Like, like he he sells his donkey sauce on the shelf and I've bought the donkey sauce and I'm like, I enjoy this. This is, you know, this is what I I expect from from him because he's he's competent himself. Right. But if it's someone like a Gordon Ramsay, yeah, like you're saying too, is like. He, he like, touts himself as being, like, a more gourmet chef. Like, he knows mm-hmm. it all, and he's, like, an elite chef, like, in the realm of, like, Wolfgang Puck or, you know... Well, he's a Michelin star chef, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't trust him to... Or, I don't really want to buy a frozen, like, mac and cheese dinner from that. Like... Right. It's just, I don't know. Yeah, it just seems like a cash grab and, like, I don't know. And don't get me started on the Michelin star restaurants because yeah. you know, when I heard about those, I thought, oh, it's like maybe some guy named Michelin, such a famous food critic. No, it's literally it was the Michelin tires and it was for travel magazines, like, like travel in the country. This is a Michelin star restaurant. So you go there. Thanks for buying our tires. <laughs> right. And also I feel like, like so many certifications, be it Michelin star or certified organic or whatever, at the end of the day, it's mostly people paying money. To get reviewed so that they can get that certification. So it's kind of not really valid or important. Hey, I got an idea. Why don't we start the Steve Craig starred podcast? So if you're a podcaster and you got the Steve Craig star, that means like uh, you're a good podcast. Oh, I like this. You're a Steve Craig approved. Yeah. So you just have to send us. Mm, let's see here. There's two of us. I'm thinking $2,000 and we'll give you a Steve Craig star. I like it. Okay. All right. Next week, we're like, hey, check out the Joe Rogan experience. <laughs> and, you know, how much like restaurants can have like up to like three stars, right? Yeah, they is up to three. Yeah. So it could be up to three. Uh, or there's two of us. So up to four stars. Right, right. All right. I like that. Yeah. Oh, we we don't care. Like if you want, if it's Joe Rogan, like, even someone worse than that, like, uh, I don't know, Tucker Carlson, if he wants to be Steve Craig certified with four stars, he's got to give us $10,000. Exactly. The one podcast that we will not do, though, I'm adamant about this, is our enemies, the office ladies. We'll send them $10,000. Take that. You can give us stars. We'll show you. Yeah. 
Wait a minute. Hmm. All right. Hey, Steve, it turns out the Gimme Chow is only hiring for a night shifts, which worries Homer since every, since evenings are when Marge and food make dinner happen. After all, he doesn't know how to make pork chops. He assumes you kill the pig in the sink. So Lisa tries to rally the family to cook dinner together as a family. So uh, Marge can work. Bart and Homer are unsure, but when Marge looks into Homer's eyes, he changes his mind. He starts to help by putting two bags of Fritos brand chips in the toaster, telling Bart to, that's how nachos are born. I assume that's true. Also gotta say, using Fritos, well, Frito scoops for nachos, it, it's it's game changer, really. It's a good move, yeah. They have better uh, structural integrity. And I'm sorry to all you Northwesterners out here. Juanita's fine ship. Not great for nachos. Too flimsy. You need the rounds, like a Totino's round chip. Yeah. Is really good for nachos. I agree. Anyways, you, we're not it, doing our Patreon exclusive nacho podcast yet. Yeah, D- not yet. Trust me, we've talked about it. That's not a joke. <laughs> no, I think we, yeah. <laughs> nacho Libre, the. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so in a nondescript building, Marge walks into a conference room with other future Gimme Chow employees, such as. Mrs. Muntz, Kirk Van Houten, Squeaky Voice Teen, Julio, Sanjay, Ruth Powers, Old Jewish Man, and Dewey Largo. Marge points out that Mr. Largo already has a job, but he says that he teaches music at a public school and then invites her to do the math because clearly he didn't. Uh, the new hires then watch a video from the CEO of Gimme Chow, Finn Bon ID. Folks, I'm Finn Bonny Day. I am CEO and head mind blower here at Gimme Chow, and I came up with a way to disrupt restaurant delivery by getting rid of the restaurants. Introducing the Gimme Chow Ghost Kitchen. 20 new delivery only dining concepts operating out of one central kitchen. Hours together, me and you and your shift manager, Jill Junderson, are gonna revolutionize food delivery and feed all our friends here in Springfield. That's the excitement I like to see. Oh, we got a question. Wait, so one kitchen is pretending to be 20 restaurants when it's actually zero restaurants? It sounds like you're catfishing the public. Think of it as catfish pole boying him, which is a special at Mama Juju's Bayou Bistro. How much does this jam pay? Minimum wage. Oh, oh, my God. Plus yeah. overtime. Sweet, juicy overtime. That'll replace the newspaper in your wallet. See the uh, Finn Boney Day. Mm-hmm. Like, that voice sounds familiar. It does. Who is that? Um, it's Jason Manzuka, Steve. Oh, okay. TikTok man himself. You might know uh, Jason Manzukis from, yeah, TikTok man from John Wick Chapter 3. Did it reprise his role in a John Wick Chapter 4, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was the dictator in The Dictator, right? With uh, everyone's favorite Sasha Baron Cohen. Great guy. Great guy. Are we going to have to get rid of that episode of Sasha Baron Cohen of The Simpsons? Are they get rid of that one on uh, Disney Plus? Oh, maybe, yeah. Uh, let's hope so. Uh, if he's found uh, guilty of his heinous uh, acts. Mm, it's a bad episode anyway, I think. It, yeah, it wasn't good. Hey, he also has been on Rules of, of Good Place, Brooklyn 999, Big Mouth. I think a lot of people will remember him from The League. How about uh, Parks and Rec? Was he in Parks and Rec? I, yeah, he yeah, was a, yeah. uh, the, the perfume guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he also has a podcast uh, called uh, How Did This Get Made? It sounds like a new podcast. Is it? Uh, it's only been around for a couple of weeks, maybe. Just another one of these dumb review podcasts where they watch something and then they talk about it for too long. Like A lot of times the, the length of the podcast episode is like, two or three times the length of the content they're watching. It's just dumb. Yeah, it's just hilarious. I mean, yeah, horrible. Uh, yeah, How Did This Get Made with Paul Shear and June Diane Raphael. God, it's probably over 10 years old now, right, that podcast? Yeah, it's it's been around. It's been a while. I feel like How Did This Get Made was one of the, uh, was or is, it still is, you know, it's still a very popular podcast, but kind of like when podcasts were starting to become a thing, it was one of your first, like, uh, Especially if you're into comedy, it was one of your first uh, podcast breaking the virgin, you know, seal of your podcast years. Yeah, and I think that they really kind of helped change the format of podcasts because a lot of it was just, especially in the comedy realm, comedians interviewing other comedians about like their craft or like how they got started or whatever. Kind of like the WTF model, which is fine, but 
I think shows like How Did This Get Made really kind of shaped a different direction that podcasts could go and that you could do all sorts of things and still be funny and entertaining. And then we came along and disproved all of that. Right. Yeah. Well, not just us, but every other podcaster out there. Yeah. If you don't know Jason Manzoukas, we, we know him a lot from uh, Comedy Bang Bang and other popular podcasts and uh, things like that. So we, we know about his personal life. Uh, doesn't uh, He's just allergic to eggs, so don't uh, feed him eggs. Doesn't post on social media. Uh, no, no social media outlet for that man. No. Likes comic books. Yeah. He has a very specific uniform. Uh, he has a uniform. He always wears like a white V-neck t-shirt and jeans. And also, what do you describe him? It sounds like we're describing like Mogwai rules. Like, don't feed him eggs. Don't post <laughs> yes. on social media. He might be an adult uh, gizmo. I think this is what happens to gizmo. <laughs> That's the story that the cartoon should have covered, is <laughs> Mogwai's growing up to be comedic uh, Greek actors. He's a typecast uh, character actor, so we all like him for that. And, and you didn't tell me that he was going to be, I guess I should have told you, he was a guest voice this week's episode. It's fun. Yeah, I, I was kind of surprised, too. Um, when I was doing my research, I saw that he was uh, guest starring, and it's kind of cool to see him. Uh, he plays a great villain. Um, another thing that he's recently been in that I really enjoyed was the Peacock show uh, based on the Sony PlayStation video game. Oh, uh, Crash Bandicoot? Yes, there it is. Crash Bandicoot. No. Um, Twisted Metal. Twisted Metal, yes. He has a uh, a story arc in that uh, first season, and he is amazing in it. And uh, that show, I don't think, got a lot of buzz. It is getting a second season. I recommend it. It's a lot of fun. Exactly what it is. It's a video game, but with story. <laughs> yeah. We think. Okay. But we're talking about The Simpsons still. He's just, just a little cog in this machine of, uh, of an episode. Uh, what's your uh, stance on a uh, ghost kitchen spoo? Uh, scary, first of all. I don't like that. What are they making? Boogers and uh, frightening fries? I think they're probably problematic. I try to avoid getting food delivery post-pandemic. I'll admit that I still do, but I do try, like, I'm sketched out by ghost kitchens because they always look a little, like, when you see them on the app, they always look a little suspect like they might be crappy like it's usually like burger bonanza or like pizza party or just like a writer's room idea of a restaurant rather real restaurant and i just i don't know it just seems a little weird what are your what do you think about them i can see from a different point if it is like a mom and pop type of deal where like we're gonna be making you know this type of food and it's you know the actual chefs and like their ideas right whereas like you know, this looks like it's just they have to learn all the dishes. Mm -hmm. So I can see from like the the individual ghost kitchens where it's like, well, we still want to make food, but we don't want to like see customers because we're afraid of people. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just going to deliver our food and not have to like have a wait staff come in and say, uh, table three doesn't like your food. You know, what are you going to do? Whereas like if the food's not good on the app, they probably just they probably don't hear about it. It's just uh, the app takes care of it. Exactly. So I can see it for introvert chef. Maybe it's great for you to have your own little little space in the ghost kitchen. Mm -hmm. But I've never I've never ordered from a ghost kitchen. So, but like you, I, I, we don't order from the the apps anymore just because it's you're, you're paying so much for those delivery fees, even if you subscribe to it for on a monthly basis. Right, and a lot of times, like even if I do order from the food apps, I try and order. This sounds kind of counterintuitive, but I order from national chains like like Taco Bell or Popeye's, because I feel like if you're ordering from the smaller chains, they're kind of getting screwed and stressed out by the amount of work that they have to do for the little pay. Yes, yeah, Steve, I did watch that John Oliver episode. Oh, good. Me too. Okay. <laughs> um, but, That's John Oliver. He talks about the, those apps. Yeah. Um, I love John Oliver, and, and I like the fact that he's on Sunday nights. Like, we don't really have that water cooler discussion anymore about, like, what we watched over the weekend, like The Simpsons. But he does offer that. But it is also always a bummer because the things they talk about are just delivered in a way that you get a lot of information. And it's usually disheartening because the world is kind of trash and people are greedy and awful. And they, they just highlighted that. So it's just it's fun, but it's also like sad to like watch that on a Sunday night and go to bed like, oh, man, I'm going to start my week. <laughs> oh, everything's awful. But yeah, that's why we watch The Simpsons that's on right. Sundays. So speaking of The Simpsons and of Ghost Kitchens. Uh, some of those restaurants that the Gimme Chow Kitchen will be uh, cooking for include... Appetite for Induction. 
Nugget Safari, Walk Tease, Atlas Grubbed, Wing Slut, Gospel Fried Catfish, Final Moo BBQ, The Fuck It Bucket, Uncle Mole's Deli, and Mama Juju's Bayou Bistro. All right, Steve, uh, which one are you ordering from? I know you, we say we don't order, but we're going to have to for, for this episode. Of course. Um, hmm. I do like uh, catfish, so gospel fried catfish could be good. Also, maybe nugget safari, just depending on the variety of nuggets they have. What are you thinking? Look, I'm a slut for wings, of course, wing slut, mm-hmm. which obviously is a, a take on the restaurant egg slut. Yeah. It's not a good name for a restaurant, no. but here we are. Uh, hey, I, I gotta fuck the bucket. I mean, the fucking bucket. Isn't that the uh, Dune popcorn bucket? Oh, yeah, that's certainly what I did with it. Let's just order them all, all right? All righty. Well, Gil tells the employees that the job is going to be easy peasy like grilled cheesy. And at first appears to be that way. Uh, Tiny Prince for uh, easy peasy grilled cheesy. And a squeaky voice team assigns it to Marge, who is delighted to be called chef. Just then another ticket pops up for 11 grilled cheeses, followed by six sushi burritos, 21 loaded churros, and the tickets keep it coming. Yeah, I don't know I, who's like who would listen if I've ever worked in a kitchen, but like the sound of receipts printing like on a busy night, and they just don't stop coming. Or like brunch service, it's so it's it's a. Uh, I I know a lot of people have had like trauma from that sound, especially with, like when the receipt keeps printing and printing. Like, oh my god, how big is this fucking order? Yeah, yeah, you just hear the tan 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 tan. It's like, oh my god, Ugh, it's stressful. Uh, so Marge calls for cheeses and old Jewish, uh, man mishears her, assuming that she's asking for, you know, the king of kings, old J-man himself. And he'll says that they'll need Jesus, Allah, Buddha, and Hashim. Dewey Largo, wearing a really nice, uh, green beanie on him. It really works. It's a good look. Uh, he carries a large pot of boiling water announcing, hot stuff coming through, chef. And Julio says that Dewey isn't his type. Good joke. Marge steps out of the walk-in loaded with various cheeses and is met by other cooks and their directional warnings like corner, behind, under, over, betwixt, and ceiling. And thanks to shows like The Bear, we're all we're all chefs now, right? Exactly, yeah. And we're in the kitchen, we like to say corner. It's just delightful. It's fun. So the squeaky voice teen acting as Expo calls out for a bologna bon mi and a veal lover's pizza before instructing Marge to fire the grilled cheeses. And Marge responds with a uh, herd chef, but uh, says that she needs to grab mayo. And as she turns, she's stabbed in the arm by a knife held by Mrs. Munz. <laughs> and she begs Marge not to press charges as her parole officer is trying to three strike her rather than break up with her like a man. <laughs> uh, Marge, uh, eager to work, says, it's not deep and it's fine, which is uh, what every girl has said to me after sex. <laughs> Not deep, and it's fine. Sounds about right. I would assume. Uh, so March searches high and low, and then someone hands her a large tub of mayonnaise called Mayo Edibiri, which, you know, again, is a reference to uh, the bear and one of its co-stars, uh, the writer, comedian, and actor Ayo Edibiri, who was great on SNL. Just uh, watch the movie Bottoms, another great thing that she's done. She's done a lot of good stuff. So Largo, who's in the weeds, comments that this is a uh, wing hut on Super Bowl Sunday all over again. So Squeaky Voice Teen asks where the hell his grilled cheeses are, and Marge assures him that she's on it, just as she spills and slips on the mayo. All the chaos causes Marge to shout out the word fuck, which she actually said but was censored, and the helpful cook hands Marge beef stock for her pho. So pho, fuck. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yep. And with that uh, music playing in the background, the, the dr- you know, the drumming and uh, the, the frantic music, mm-hmm. uh, the one-shot take essentially, of, like, the last episode from season one of, uh, it was the last episode of season one of The Bear, I think it was. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah. Well, back at 742, Evergreen Terrace Marge stirs in her sleep, saying, yes, chef, no, chef, and get your dumpling off my burner. So she wakes to discover it's uh, 346 in the afternoon. So she asks Homer, why didn't he wake her? And he tells her that he tried, but she hit him with a spatula, and then he shows the uh, red spatula mark on his cheek. Marge is hurt that uh, she slept through the one day she had with her family, but uh, Lisa is eager to learn about her mom's new job. How are things at Gimme Chow, Mom? It's been two months of hell. Last night, Kirk lost the tip of his finger in someone's disco fries. Disco guy? Like disco fr- Oh, God! 
So how's dinner been going without me? Great. Tonight we're all making lasagna. You know, cooking as a family has been kind of fun, right, kids? Mm-hmm. Oh. Knowing you all are making home-cooked meals together is the only thing getting me through this. Love you so much. Bye. She's gone. It's gimme chow time. I'm getting pizza, pierogies, and paella. Fish and chips and cake pops for me. Guys, we've been ordering delivery for two months. I'm getting an ulcer from all the lying. Or all the chili rellenos. We gotta tell Mom. Hey, 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 bu -bu 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 -bu. let's not do anything rash. We'll totally cook for ourselves tomorrow. But we still need to eat tonight, right? I mean, uh, Lisa's conscience is a little uh, off on this, but, uh, you, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I feel like Lisa should have said no from the beginning, but she's down with the shenanigans. Yeah, I think probably Homer, like he did there, like, urged her to, like, we have an option for you, a vegetarian option, so you can join in. And so maybe she just liked to be part of it. But yeah, her her morality is a little, a little uh, late on this. I agree. But, I mean, when you use those food delivery apps, you're not ordering from multiple places. I understand, like, this is, like, a ghost kitchen that's supposed to be all the same, you know, location. But right. as as people with the... As, as consumers, we don't know that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think when it comes to, like, the ghost kitchen, it's not so much that. It's, like, the businesses, like, a Chuck E. Cheese will pass their name off as, like, Pasquale's Pizza. Yeah. And that's a big fuck you, I think, to consumers. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, like, I know, like, like the stories of, like, other, like, more established places just doing crappy frozen things, like frozen chicken or whatever. And it's coming from, yeah, like, was a Taco Bell or something. No, it was it was Applebee's. They would do this. Uh, it was like a wing store, or whatever, like Wing Hut. I don't know what it was called, but it was literally just Applebee wings. Right, right. Not cool Applebee's. Mm -mm. I thought it used to be cool Applebee's, but now look at you. Ah, uh, Applebee's was never cool. Hey, when you're 16 and you are taking your a uh, 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 girl out on a date, it's the most romantic place you can afford. That's true. And even if you're like 22 and taking a girl out on a date and you want to <laughs> have a fun cocktail, that's actually not a bad place. No. <laughs> And if you're in your 40s and are going for a walk and you just want a beer, it's fine, Steve. It's fine. Yeah, totally. If it's the closest bar that you have to you, it's fine. Yeah, no worries. And hey, if they have 50 cent wings at that time you're there and you get them, it's fine too. Yeah, and if, you know, you become like a regular and it's like Norm when he goes into Cheers, but it's like, Craig, that's 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 fine. No, that's when you know to stop going. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I know my limits, Steve. <laughs> So Homer does try to entice Lisa with some Indian food, and she admits that she is, you know, a little hungry. So Homer offers her some tofu tikka masala, and much like her father, she goes, Mmm, tofu tikka masala. And back in the ghost kitchen, Marge calls for that saucy Indian dish when uh, Gil walks in with some good news. He yells at them to keep working, and then says that because they've been all such rock stars, management is giving them all smartwatches. Kirk wonders if they're, uh, these smartwatches are Apple watches, but Gil says that they're actually ankle watches, or, you know, monitors, really, that buzz and say things and to ensure that the workers are always hustling and uh, grinding. I'm kind of enjoying uh, Gil being the villain of this episode. Yeah, and kind of the villain of this season. Like, there was another episode where he was kind of a huge jerk, and I, I, I think it works on him. I think it's an interesting commentary on uh, kind of the economy and where we're at, where those lovable losers now have mid-level management jobs where they can be the, the heel of of work instead of being pathetic losers. Yeah, they've been taking the sad sack characters now and turning them into jerks like Kirk Van Halen. Yeah, you know, Gil. It's interesting. Who who's next? Steve is uh like I could I know that Trent. Mo has been like questionable with his morality. But I wouldn't want to see him go full villain because Moe's kind of level. No, no, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not putting Mo in that category. It'd be like, uh, like Agnes. If not, see, like, yeah, if they just turn Agnes, no, I don't know. Who is another questionable? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, Steve later, Marge pays a visit to Gil's office, asking if he had a chance to ask payroll about overtime. He did. He has an amusing anecdote about it saying that since they work past midnight, those hours count as a new day. So there will be no overtime. Marge remarks that the story wasn't funny at all. So just then, her ankle watch detects rest and gives Marge some motivational shocks to get her moving. Do you ever have bad dreams? 
of you're trying to close your place of business, but like you can't get it clean and people keep coming in. You're like, I, we're closed. What's going on? You guys need to leave. I'm trying to leave. And, oh, yeah. Those, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a, a very common dream that I've had. Yes. It's, it's horrible. <laughs> uh, it'll kill you one day, Steve. Don't worry. I'm sure it will. Well, as she runs in place, Marge tells Gil that she and the other Gimme Chow employees work hard for their money and he is stealing it. And Gil responds that Gimme Chow is just a startup and money is really tight. On the financial news program, Demented Dollars host Fiscal Cliff tells another story. Gimme Chow, more like holy cow, because their stock just went through the roof. Ever since the pivot to Ghost Kitchens, this app is on fire. We've got Gimme Chow CEO, Finn Bunny Day, who, as of today, is the world's newest billionaire. Billionaire? Finn, congrats. What's your secret? No secret, Cliff. I just work a lot harder than anybody else at Gimme Chow. Mom, is everything okay? I'm fine, honey. Just watching the man who's been cheating me out of my overtime pay. It kind of shakes my faith in billionaires. Oh, this is all my fault. I feel so guilty you're having to work this hard. It's okay, sweetie. We're getting there. Slowly. <sighs> it just never seems to go up. Cliff, Gimme Chow is a family, united by one goal, enriching our shareholders. I mean that. <gasps> united. That's it. You could start a union. At the beginning of that clip, I really like Marsh just sitting in front of the TV in a dark room, having a beer like after work. Like It just feels like a very human thing that she doesn't get to do often, and she's like, earn that beer. So it's a really cool image. I think it's relatable to anyone who works in the industry. Yeah, exactly. I don't think it has to be food industry. It's just, yeah, who works. Anybody, yeah. You... Just anyone in life, yeah. <laughs> work sucks, and it, uh, yeah. So where's Homer? Is he Homer just at Moe's? Probably. Yeah. I like the the line of, uh, it's really hard for Mars to trust billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so weird that like, time stepping this episode that this came out like a week after the John Oliver episode we were talking about where it was all about food delivery apps and are they actually making money or not? Who knows? Yeah, it's it's uh, all a little suspect and who knows, but uh, yeah. So uh, Marge thinks that a union could be good, but we all know how she feels about fusses, let alone making them. Uh, also, this is the, the debut of Cliff, uh, Fiscal Cliff. We've never seen it before. Kind of a Jim Cramer parody, if you will. I feel like they did more of a direct parody of Jim Cramer, where it was like a bald guy who would yell about financial stuff. But I think that this is the first of this specific guy, but they kind of retro... Re Red condom, I think. Uh, so Finn tells Cliff that he's about to do ayahuasca with uh, Jeff Bezos in outer space. So we have an indigenous person who is an ayahuasca shaman putting a space helmet on Finn's head. And Marge is ready to bring the jerk back down to Earth. She meets with her co-workers in the parking lot. Uh, but Kirk is wary since the podcast who tells him to be a free thinker says that unions are for communists. Kirk is one of our listeners, right? I think so, yeah. that's We're the free thinking podcast. <laughs> Marge explains that unions are the reason we have child labor laws, pensions, and the weekend. And who is surprised to learn that the Canadian R&B singer, songwriter, and a former guest of The Simpsons was the union's idea. It's a very funny joke. Uh, Marge gets feedback from the drivers of Gimme Chow, such as Luigi, who hates the company because they drove him out of business. And then they ripped him off. He holds up a pizza box with an image of a chef that looks an awful lot like him, saying, Luigi's Pizza, I'm a worse but cheaper. He wants to act, but is afraid to rock the boat. And Marge hands out union cards for the workers to consider, and then begs them to keep all of this quiet for the moment, so management doesn't find out. Unfortunately, all this was heard loud and clear through the employee's ankle watches. So the next day, Gil offers a treat for the workers, for no reason whatsoever. Management has asked him to play an educational video. And uh, after calling the workers in grace, he plays the animated video. Hey team, if you're watching this, your kitchen has been infested, but not with mice or roaches, which are fine, but with talk of unionizing. Hmm. Unionizing? What's that? Sounds scary. It is, Chef. Joining a union would add another person to your kitchen. 
the Union Ogre. Oh, I create an unnecessary barrier between you and management. And I take money out of your pocket. Hey, I could have bought a neck tattoo with that. Let's kill this monster before he kills us. <laughs> They'd rather spend their money on unsubtle cartoons than paying us fairly. At least make it live action. We're grown-ups, people. Yeah! yeah. There's Betty Boop. That does it. Marge, here's my signed union card. We're with you, honey. Yeah, where's Betty Boop, Steve? Where is Betty Boop? Just reminds me of that episode of The Office, uh, which I doubt they covered, uh, The Office Ladies, right? When mm -hmm. Was it like the warehouse trying to unionize? Yeah. And that like always made me wonder, like, well, that's a good thing. They should be a union, but they made it sound like it was bad. It's true. Um, like, I'm definitely pro-union. It just, it, it depends, I think, on the size of the company, too. Like, I remember at my old store, um, there had, like, 12 employees, and somebody wanted to unionize. And, like, I just feel like that is kind of, like, a not the best use of money or time, you know, because it's a small thing, and you could just say how you felt anyway. But, yeah, for bigger companies, like, uh, I don't know, a certain coffee company where the employees wear green aprons. I'm a union man. Yeah. Through and through, Steve. Yeah. Unions. Pro-union. Yeah. Except for unless we're talking about full war. The new A24 movie that's opening April 14th. I don't know. Exactly. No, I'm, I'm joking. No, unions are good. Workers' rights, communism. It's all, it's all, I'm a fan of it all. All right. All of the workers uh, hand marks their union cards in solidarity. Mrs. Munz holds a sign that, sees, that says onion, but, you know, pretty close to union. Mm -hmm. uh, Gil witnesses this and steams in anger. Uh, that evening, Homer's in bed, dining on food from various Gimme Chow restaurants when he hears Marge coming. He swoops up all the food into a trash bag and uh, hides it behind him, using it as a pillow. So Marge steps, in, uh, steps into the bedroom to announce that she started a union. Homer says how great that is before letting out a large burp, blaming the family-made Tuscan Osobusco that the family didn't make. Marge wonders if management will retaliate, but Homer tells her not to worry, sleepily saying that corporations aren't vengeful, they're just people. Vengeful people. Well, the following day, Gil has some news for Marge. Management has decided to reimagine her role in the company. Marge assumes that uh, she's being fired for starting a union, but despite Gil's wishes, they can only let her go for being bad at her job. Instead, she's been promoted to delivery driver and has to deliver 40 orders in 60 minutes. <laughs> if uh, not, she's out on her keister with mm. cause. It's, uh, that's a lot of uh, orders in an hour. That is. It's uh, too many, I would say. Uh, not but humanly possible. No. Unless all 40 orders were going to the same uh, location. Yeah, maybe like a business park or something. Or a homeless camp with uh, stolen credit cards. Oh, that's true, too. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, Marge's car is loaded with the food, and she's ready to go. In a scene reminiscent of Greece, a rockabilly woman uh, takes off her scarf and holds it up as if she's about to drop it. But instead, her black and white checkerboard panties fall to the ground, signifying Marge can go. What did you think of that? I, I, I didn't hate it. I just thought it was an odd choice. Um... Yeah, it was just kind of odd. <laughs> You're right. I'm watching the scene, like, what's the significance of her? Did she lose weight? Yeah, I don't know. Because uh, she the checkerboard flag when you are racing, but yeah. <laughs> like, why is she pulling down her, like, why did her panties fall? I don't know. It's just weird. Maybe it's uh, Caesar's uh, kink. Could be. Um, Caesar, no shaming for you. Go do what you think. Is it because it's Mrs. Munts and she's like, because if you watch it again, mm -hmm. was her scarf attached to her panties because as soon as she takes the scarf off, the panties drop. Maybe. And, you know, but her, she does have a career dropping panties um, as, you know, uh, in the stripping world. So maybe, yeah, that makes sense. Who knows, Steve? Who right. knows? Well, Marge uh, drives through town, hitting several familiar streets, if you're in Portland, uh, Oregon, such as Ankeny, Everett, Clickitat, Northrop, and Pettigrove. Uh, she speeches into the parking lot of the Quickie Mart, where Snake Jailbird is holding up uh, one Apu Nahasapita Metablon, who we haven't seen in six seasons, uh, although he still remains unvoiced. But it's good to see him. Didn't last week we said as a joke, like, and you get to see Apu. He's back. Yeah, I think we did. And it's true. We were right. Yeah. Yeah. Does that mean we have but to was the podcast? No, but, but it was supposed to be voiced by uh, Timothy Chalamet. Oh, uh, yes, that's right. <laughs> Let's give it time. March tosses the food delivery to both of them and uh, continues on her way. 
So she speeds through Springfield, hitting up Pettigrove Street, Cornell Road, Vista Avenue, Salmon, and Thurman. So she flings a football-shaped sandwich from Gridiron Grinders, which hits Hans Moment in the crotch. Very fun uh, callback joke. Mm -hmm. She then hits on her e-brake to make a quick turn to throw a pizza through the window of Android Dungeons and Baseball Card Shop. And inside comes the guys building a ship in a bottle. But the pizza box smashes that, and Jeff Albertson shakes his fist in anger, but then enjoys a slice of uh, pizza. Nice. Uh, so Krusty is waiting outside, wondering where the hell his banana cream pie is. <laughs> This might be my favorite gag of the whole episode. Mine too. Uh, Marcy hits him with her car, <laughs> knocking him into the building behind him. Like he's unconscious. We don't know if he's dead. Yeah. And then she gently tosses the pie and it just lands between his legs. No harm, no foul aside from getting hit by the car. Uh, just a great, like, uh, the definition of comedy where it's you have expectations and you don't get those expectations. It's just perfect. It's a uh, pie on a pie. Exactly. Bridge opens up to let a boat pass below. And so Marge floors it, jumping over that open bridge, dropping a bag of food to the sea captain who is in the barge below. So seeing that she has one last order, Marge is sure she's going to make it. Not going to make she, it. She realizes the order is too big to throw. So she takes everything by hand. And as she exits the car, she trips and falls. Food is everywhere. And her ankle monitor tells her that the delivery is failed. And just then, the door opens and Marge learns who the food is for Despite the fact that, you know, shouldn't she know what her home address is from the yeah. app? All right, let's go to a clip. Foods! Ah, here! Homer, your user, mmm, food. You've been placing giant orders every night. We thought it was a hobo camp with a stolen credit card. <gasps> you haven't been cooking at all. Sushi time! <gasps> Worst of all, my family lied to me. Yeah, worst of all is you're fired with cause! <laughs> if you're hungry, we've got dinner. I am so hungry. My mom's eating all the empanadas with the wrong sauces. Not the Verde, use the Roja. Roja! She wouldn't starve her family over one little act of betrayal, would she? Let's go for the pot stickers, real casual. Huh? No wonder this jug hasn't been going up. You've been getting delivery for weeks. I'm glad that she brought that up because in the episode when I'm watching, I'm like, she's trying to save money, yet all that money is probably going away. <laughs> yeah, you figure dinner for three for yeah. takeout for every day. Weeks on end. Yeah, that's like probably like at least 50 bucks a day. That's. <laughs> Well, yeah, with Homer's appetite, no more. True. Yeah, so we're talking like seventy-five, maybe even a hundred dollars a day for at least two months. So, yeah, that's that's quite a bit. Also weird that like Marge doesn't pick up the patterns. Like, wow, this is all the food that uh, Lisa likes, Bart likes, mm -hmm. Homer likes. I mean, granted, you know, food is food, but and then there's the whole garbage situation because that produces a lot of like paper waste that would be yeah in the trash cans that Homer would have to hide. Yeah. That's okay. It's just a cartoon. That's true. So Homer tells Marge that they tried cooking and then asks if she had any idea how hard it is to make dinner every single night. Marge growls in anger, shocked that her whole family would betray her. She then thinks how her union family would never do that. She then tearfully realizes that she can't be a part of that family anymore. Oh no. Does that mean she's leaving the Simpsons TV show? I think so. She's going to show up on the Connors. <laughs> well, they need a new mom, right? Exactly. It's been a few seasons. I'm assuming that, uh, does John Goodman's character, uh, does Dan date on that show? I haven't, you know, after they canceled Roseanne, I'm like, I'm not watching this. <laughs> right. I don't know. Like, maybe he and Jackie hook up. I think she's a lesbian, Steve. Oh. I, I think it'd be funny if, like, uh, you know, like the sitcoms always had, like, the less than attractive male. I'm not saying John Goodman's not attractive, of course. Mm. Um, but, like, all of a sudden... Sydney Sweeney shows up as like Dan's <laughs> new girlfriend. You know? Yeah. But like no one says anything like she's not in your league. Yeah, it's just normal. It, it's much like Jerry Seinfeld always like dates a supermodel in Seinfeld. And so does or George. George, yeah. But yeah, just then uh, the doorbell rings. It's the uh, give me child workers who, as Largo puts it, are so Manchego cheesed about not getting paid their overtime that they decide to go on strike. So they can't go on strike without their leader. Julio, after calling Marge tube dress, informs her that 
all of the other delivery app workers are striking as well, meaning that every food delivery app in Springfield is now shut down. Marge shouts, yes, in delight. And in the background, Homer lets out a long disappointed, no. <laughs> so the headline of the Springfield Shopper has the headline, Gimme Chow Strike, Hell No, No More to Go. Homer views this on his phone at work. And I think that's a nice touch because they did the kind of like the classic spitty newspaper headline thing. But it zooms out and you realize that it's uh, horizontal because he's re- looking at it on his phone. So they're updating the shopper with his time. So without realizing it, he's become addicted to Gimme Chow and hasn't eaten since the uh, strike began. Carl offers that he should get something from the cafeteria. But to Homer, food now only tastes good if somebody brings it to him. Well, Homer leans back at his workstation and his uh, big old butt pushing a lever that causes an alarm to sound. Lenny switches the lever back and he and Carl warn Homer that he could have fired every electronic device in Springfield. Homer says, mmm, fried electronic device, and then realizes that it doesn't make any sense. His hunger is affecting his sanity, and he's willing to bargain with anyone for his precious delivery back. I'd sign a deal with the devil himself to get my gimme chow back. (coughs) Hello? Yes, this is Union Rebel Rouser Marge Simpson's husband. Tonight on Dallas, the gimme chow strike. Sweet for labor or bad for business? You decide! Zooming in from Springfield, Union Capo, Marge Simpson. Marge, I'm going to be as impartial as possible here. Why are you starving, America, with your psychotic demands? We're not starving anyone. All we want is our fair share. Is that too much to ask? Yes, and here to tell us why is Gimme Chow's new brand ambassador, Homer Simpson. What? Hey, Cliff, big fan of your whole deal. Homer, you're working for them? I sure am. I was honored when Gimme Chow offered to pay me in Gimme Chow gift cards to talk to America about how unions get in the way of innovation. You're in a union at the nuclear plant. And I haven't innovated one thing over there. We hoping that uh, Flanders devil popped up so yeah. he could sign the, the deal. <laughs> <laughs> and get another forbidden donut. Yeah. I uh, know. So Homer goes on to say that they're living in the future and his phone can get him anything he could ever want. Song, sneakers, and anonymous gay hookups, or so he hears. Uh, why shouldn't it also bring him food? Marge asks if it's worth it at the cost of human misery, but Homer argues that misery is how we got all the best stuff. Pyramids, railroads, blues, those great soccer stadiums and guitar, all of the things that America loves. So did you take it as when Homer said, you know, we didn't play the clip, but when he says that uh, the phone can give him song sneakers and anonymous gay hookups like that he was hiding something like has homer you know because he kind of brushes off it's like oh yeah that's what i hear has homer like had a gay hookup here's my theory i think he downloaded the grinder app thinking he was going to get sandwiches and then you know he like clicked a few buttons and then like before he knew it he was meeting a gay man at a sandwich shop they had a foot long and then he had another foot long and, you know, it wasn't the best experience for him, but he didn't hate it. And he still thinks about it from time to time. And every now and then, you know, Chunky Lover 69 gets on that app. The gay bar is right across the street from Moe's. So if, you know, it's a Wednesday night and you've had a few duffs, you know, things happen. I feel like that was a, that could have been a 30 Rock joke if 30 Rock was on the air now. I <laughs> Liz would have said I downloaded a grinder and it was not what I expected because she would have wanted it to be about sandwiches as well. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, hey, Homer asks Marge why she hates America, and then is hit in the head with a bar of soap thrown by Marge. So she throws more toiletries at him, and he sits on the toilet wearing a sport coat, a bow tie up top, and uh, just underpants below. As the uh, fake background goes away, Marge makes a plea to the audience, encouraging everyone to respect workers' rights to join her and her union on the picket line. She tells the people, when we stand together, we win. Hear, hear. The Gimme Chow workers march in front of Town Hall, holding up signs that say, Labor Rules, No Justice, No Pizza, and Chop Onions, Not Unions. Now, if I can be a little persnickety, I think Mrs. Munt's holding up the onion sign and confusing it for a union. Great joke. I think having the Chop Onions, Not Unions later kind of lessens that joke. My own opinion. And that's what's important about your opinions. Exactly. Like my butthole. I got one and it stinks. Kurt tells Marge that her speech was successful saying that the whole town is with them. Then a mob of people walk towards the picket line chanting, but their message isn't as positive as Marge would hope. Then, as violence is about to break out in this clip, 
Vin Von D flies down in his personal helicopter. Hey, hey, we get how you feel. Oh, that's so nice. Now get in the kitchen and cook our meals. What? Attention, Union thugs. The eaters of Springfield have had enough. You have awoken a lazy giant. You're just corporate shell standing in the way of justice. Shut up, burger flippers. Just for that, I'm gonna spit in your face instead of your food. <laughs> Good news, everyone! I found a way to end the strike. Yay! You're meeting our demands? No! I'm firing everyone! Aww. Because Gimme Chow Ghost Kitchens are now fully robotic, and food deliveries are back with non-complaining drones. Yay! Ah. <sighs> I guess the greed of the most selfish will always squash any hope of a decent life for the rest of us. Oh, man, that's kind of bleak. But it's the future you want, Steve. It's true. <laughs> um, and by the way, the group that Homer is leading against his own wife, uh, just because he loves to delivery food so much, is titled SELF, which is, stands for Self-Entitled Lovers of Food. I think I could be a member of SELF. Yeah, I mean, I, I like food and I'm selfish and entitled, so yeah, that makes sense. Finn calls over to Homer, complimenting him on his great work, saying that he couldn't have busted the union without him. So he gives him extra props for stabbing Marge in the back. And when Homer hears that, he discovers it sounds like he stabbed his wife in the back. <laughs> so he sees the Union consoling each other while drones drop off pork chop planet bag in his hands. So Homer looks at that dry gray meat as drones carry uh, food from all over the ghost kitchens, restaurants fly above him. Homer thinks to himself that getting fried food delivered by electronic drone devices would be a dream come true. But then he has an epiphany. In fried electronic devices. It all makes sense now. So he goes to the power plant and pulls the lever, warning of a risk of massive electromagnetic pulse. This causes all the drones to short out and drop the bags of food they were holding. As it rains, donuts, burgers, and pizza, the union cheers. Various residents of Springfield begin to eat food off the ground while fiscal cliff reports of zucchini fries and apple pies fall from the sky. But nothing is tanking as fast as Gimme Chow's stock. He then asks where his prop tank is. And uh, Finn Boney Day talks on the phone, stating that his, as a disruptor, he can't get disrupted. The crusher of unions. Just then, Demented Dollars Tanks runs him over, and Fiscal <laughs> Cliff blames himself for not using union prop guys. So <laughs> Finn's dead, right? Never coming back? Yeah, I think so, yeah. All right. Well, Marge watches all of this at home while Homer calls out to her. Marge! Homer, only you can make a mess this big. I did it for you, honey. All of food in the world means nothing to me if you're not there to keep me from choking on it. With his automated robots destroyed, Finn Bonnie Day was forced to hire union workers at a fair wage, including overtime. Homer used his Gimme Chow gift cards to pay off the chicken's medical expenses, and Marge forgave Homer, but then brought it up every time they fought for the rest of their marriage. I like how uh, Raphael is the one that narrates at the end, but reminds me much of the, the James Earl Jones with the um, uh, Lord of the Flies episode, right? Yeah, yeah. And let's Just say us. Mo. <laughs> you know how like all the drones, all the electromagnetics like destroyed? Mm -hmm. It should have been like in the background images of like airplanes <laughs> crashing because he destroyed all the electromagnetics. <laughs> that would have been funny, kill, yeah. Killing a bunch. But but maybe maybe too soon because of all the uh issues with going on with Boeing right now. Maybe not have that kind of a joke, right? Yeah, they almost they already almost missed something with the uh with the bridge. And the barge. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, they were accidentally very timely. So, yeah, maybe it's good that they didn't do that, but that would have been funny. But, yeah, that, so Marge and Homer, happily ever after, they got the chicken bill paid. And that is our episode. Let's say we take a break, think about what we just saw, and then we'll finish up our discussion. We'll be right back.
All right, everybody, we're back. Let's finish up our discussion of Night of the Living Wage. We'll talk about the things that we liked in this episode, the things that made us laugh, our most valuable jokester, if you will, and what we thought about the episode and what we're watching next week. But before we do all of that, we like to give each other a gift or two. Craig, I know that, you know, you're a bit of a tech guy and you like your food. So I got you your very own drone so that you can deliver your food to yourself and be like, hmm, that's good, and I made it. And uh, I also got you a Demented Dollars tank so you can run over any big corporate CEOs that you see walking down the street. The drone? That's fun. But uh, I got to say, the other president, uh, tanks. You're very welcome. Well, Steve, I just got you one thing, and it's a fucking bucket. So do whatever you want with it. Oh, I know what I'm going to do with it. I'm going to enjoy it. Sexually. Oh, Steve. Uh, All righty. Craig, what did you, uh, what made you laugh in this episode? I think I agree with you. The classic cream pie joke of expecting Krusty to get a cream pie in the face, but yet gets badly injured in a car hitting him. Very funny. And then the pie just slightly uh, <laughs> getting tossed to him. Uh, I love the uh, Union cartoon. And that line when there's like, Largo's like, why? We're adults. Why are we watching this cartoon? <laughs> it's very funny. Uh, and the animation style like reminds me of like, uh, it's kind of like we didn't talk about it, but it was like, kind of very South Parky in a way without the cardboard cutouts uh, i i know it's not uh my favorite joke but scene wise i liked the panicky bear s- season one of just trying to get all that food together very well done uh in, in the kitchen i thought it was great uh yeah those are probably my favorite uh favorite gags do i give it to marge for a joke story i mean she's not really providing i mean she's providing the humor but is there yeah, yeah I, i'll give it to marge why not i think uh did i give it to marge I gave it to our clan of the cave mom, I'm pretty sure. Marge is winning this uh, this season here. It's true. I had three March heavy episodes in a row. Yeah, the uh, crusty bit is probably my favorite. Um, I liked in the beginning the assigned um, animals to the people. I think uh, when uh, Truth Ann asked for help and one was an empath, the other one was like, save me apples because they wanted their horse to save them. That was funny. Um, I do like the uh, video about the, the anti-union video. Um, especially the line from Tress about um, her saying, this kitchen is fested, but not with uh, mice and cockroaches. That's fine. I like Homer being just so inept about like how to make pork chops and assuming that you have to kill the pig in the sink. Do we give it to Marge? I think, yeah, it, it's tough. I think that um, Manzukas did a great job as evil CEO who kind of looks like Mr. Burns, like a younger Mr. Burns, which I appreciate because it's kind of like that naturally born evilness. So yeah, I think I'm going to give it to Marge with um, Homer as a close second. But um, Craig, what did you think overall of this episode? The young Mr. Burns looking also maybe uh, Jeremy Allen White, the star of the bear himself. Oh, yes. It's true. I also forget to mention, I love that joke of uh, in the beginning, it was like the Gimme Chow, you know, videos like this is owned by Jill Junderson. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Fun joke. Do we need to mention this too? There's actually like actual artwork for this episode there's like a, yeah. a poster do do they make posters for every episode i don't know if it's every episode but i feel like a lot more than they ever have done before because i'll see them online and they're really artfully done they're really beautiful yeah yeah maybe that was uh jason manzoukas said I- i'll do this episode but you gotta make me a poster so i could put it on my wall mm-hmm. and if you haven't seen it i mean i guess we should we could post it on our social medias uh, before this episode airs, but like, yeah, it's it's really well done. I I, I know they make posters for like the uh, Treehouse of Horror. Mm-hmm. We're kind of coming off of the famous. Uh, if people are listening to this in the future, like future future, we're kind of coming off of the 2023 SAG and uh, WGA strike. So there's kind of a lot of a uh, undertones of that mm-hmm. with about unions in it. Um, Really kind of also coming off the pandemic about uh, all these food delivery apps. So a lot of parallels going on there. Very layered episode. Much like an onion, Steve. Mm. <laughs> this episode has layers. And I like how, you know, I, when I'm watching it, I'm like, the, th- the things that I'm complaining about in my head were addressed. You know, like uh, Homer's excessive spending. And uh, this one's about the little man. You know, the, the people that aren't the... The CEOs, and we all don't like uh, billionaires. Mm-hmm. It's weird that people that idolize the billionaires, like people idolizing Elon Musk, it's just fucking weird. It is. Gross. Yeah. Sorry if there's Elon Musk stands out there that are listeners, but uh, you do you. But, you know, hey, 
I don't worship the guy. Mm -hmm. It's weird. And, uh, you know, about union workers' rights. uh, And there's a lot of fun stuff in the area. Like we said, I like uh, Gil being kind of the, you know, he's he's also part of the problem, but he also doesn't understand that, that, you know, like he's upper management, but he's not a billionaire. Right. And it's great, of course, uh, hearing Manzukis's voice, which uh, we're fans of the Zooks on this podcast. So yeah, this was a, a fun Marge episode. Everyone got uh, a little taste of hilarity. So I recommend this episode. If I had to give it a ranking, look, the episode started off with uh, trying to fix a broken chicken. And Steve, I'll let you know the average uh, chicken can last uh, five to 10 years. So if, you know, they waited a few years... They probably won't have to pay that bill, right? Yeah. Put it on so bill. It'll be, hey, I get it. Like a duck bill, which aren't uh, chicken, Steve. They're ducks. True. Okay. So uh, if I give this episode, I was just going to say, out of 10, I was going to rate this episode out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't rank it out of the age of a life expectancy of a chicken. Instead, I'll rank it out of the life expectancy of a uh, Jason Manzucas. So I'll give this um, a 76. That's fair. How about you, Steve? Uh, Well, yeah, Craig, this episode, I think, is uh, a lot of fun, very timely. Um, You know, the issues with ghost kitchens and um, just kind of that in general is kind of a big talking point, I think, coming out of the pandemic. And like you, I think what you're saying about uh, the timeliness of this, about this writer strike, the actor strike and post pandemic is very, very apt. And I also just think it's an interesting commentary on modern day capitalism in general about how there's, you know, these people like the little guys who are just trying to get by, trying to survive, trying to have enough money. And I think Marge's line about how one medical crisis, even if it's from, as Bart puts it, a bougie ass chicken can really ruin a family. And that's very true. And I think that this example of like Marge having to get a job just to pay for that and then the struggle of that and getting screwed over by a big corporation and a big billionaire who, you know, has the face of like, you know, I'm here to help people and disrupt like the status quo, but in reality, I'm just screwing over people to make money. I think it's a all a very good point. I think the episode is fun and funny, but also has a great commentary. Also, it had a, a lot of great uh, callbacks to The Simpsons, like aside from Marge's job, I think Hans Holman, Hans Molman getting hit in the groin with the grinder. Very funny. All in all, I had a good time. I'm really liking our little Marge run. I think that it just shows what an interesting and fun character that she is. This is just a great episode. It's interesting to see, you know, Homer being kind of jerk-ass Homer, but in a in a way that he redeemed himself at the end. So all in all, I had a great time with this. And so the average uh, Grubhub worker, it works out to be about $15 an hour, which is a hard gig um, and a lot of hard work for not a lot of pay, and you hope you get those tips. So out of 15, I'm going to give this a solid 15 plus tip. Good episode all around. A lot of fun and good job, Cesar Mazariegos. As you know, I know you've been up with this, with the uh, company, the Simpsons, the Simpsons company for a while, but I think that, you know, you like all five episodes that we've watched of yours have been really good. And so it's uh, great to see a new voice who offers an interesting perspective. So great stuff. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> I appreciate it. Craig, I got to tell you, last week I said your impression was the best impression we've ever done on the show. That is Of a Nic- Nicolas Cage? Yeah. But that impression that you just did is the most accurate Cesar Masariegos impression I have ever heard, without a doubt. All right. All right, Craig. Um, well, you know, we had a new episode this week, so you know what that means. New episode next week. Of course not. No, we have oh. not a new episode, so we have to bust out. That good old wheel of random. It's back from Easter what's, vacation. What's going on with uh we're on one week, off one week. Yeah. What what's the is there a significance for uh uh I guess what is it, April fourteenth? Is it uh is it cause they're like oh, the Simpsons fans, they're not gonna get their taxes done if we put an episode on Sunday. So they gotta they gotta do their taxes because the following Monday is uh, tax day, right? I think that's what it is. Like they imagine us all the Simpsons fans standing in line at the post office trying to figure out our taxes, like wrapping it up in tape, like it's shaped like a football so we can throw it in there. We're doing math and Professor Frank tells us that we carried the one wrong. Yeah, that's, I think that's what's going on. So they want to give us a break. That's awfully not nice of them. They're sweet, the Fox Corporation, like all corporations. Uh, so let's give the wheel of random a spin to see which season we're in. Boop. So 
don't, 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 don't. Alrighty, we have season thirteen going back all the way to season thirteen. All right, let's give the wheel another spin to see which episode we're watching. All righty, we have episode three, season 13, episode three. Now, Craig, what do you think the title of this episode is? Whew, uh, well, this episode we just watched was called Night in a Living Wage, parody of Night of the Living Dead, George Romero, classic, right, about the zombies. So for no other reason, I, I assume that this episode from season 13 was also a parody of a George Romero film. So I'm going to say it is a parody of his 1977 film, Martin. And this episode will be called Martin, parentheses, Prince. I like it. But unfortunately, that's not quite correct. Uh, the title of this episode they're about to watch next week is entitled Homer the Mo. I guess this is it, Steve. I know this episode, which means if I get this correct, we're out of here, right? No more podcast? I think those are the rules. All right. I'm sorry, Steve, but uh, fans out there, I know this episode. It's about Mo, the bartender, turning Homer's car hole into a bar. And Marge is happy about it. And in the B story, Lisa starts a strip club with Janie. Wow. It's a vegan strip club. Of course, yeah. Well, I mean, you're, you've are said a lot of words that are true. And accurate. So, Mo turns his bar, Moe's, into a hangout for Springfield's beautiful people, forcing Homer to start a bar of his own inside his car hole. So, I mean, I think we'll have to wait till next week to find out, but I think you're kind of vaguely correct. Ah, oh, man. I thought you were going to say, no, it was a garage, not a car hole. <laughs> so, you do have well, get... some memory of this uh, episode. Yes. Mostly the B story. Yeah. You remember that B story very well. Uh, there are, uh, you know, a very special uh, guest or two or four in this episode. A little. Can I name them? Sure. All right. Uh, again, just from the top of my head, um, I believe it's going to be Dan Aykroyd, Harold Ramis, Bill Murray, and Ernie Hudson. Ah, uh, though that is an all-star lineup of four great guys. But uh, I think this is another uh, group of four lads, more mostly from Athens, Georgia. Wait, Steve, is this an episode of Are You Talking Aria You Ever Read Me? I think it might be. That's right. We have a very special uh, musical guest, R.E.M., Michael Stipe and himself, and the rest. Michael Stipe and himself? Yes. All right. Uh, so, yeah, I'm excited. I have a vague memory of this episode, but it's been a long time since I've seen it. Uh, it's kind of funny because last week we had, uh, you know, Marge looking for a friend and uh, Everybody Hurts plays by R.E.M., so now we get them again, so that's fun. Outstanding, Steve. Outstanding. That's right. And you know what else is outstanding? Our listeners. And we thank you for listening, and hey, if you want to contact us, reach us out on the socials, like your Instagram or your YouTube, at 138Simpsons. And you can always email us at 138Simpsons at gmail.com. And while you're emailing us, go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your fine podcast, but you don't have to leave us a real review. No, just go ahead and tell us uh, what uh, shameful things you order on your food delivery service apps. That's right. And hey, if you would like, you can also leave us a voicemail and just click on that microphone and uh, just do us your best Cesar Maza Riegos impression or uh, your best Marge impression or your best Jason Manzucas impression. Whatever you want, we just want to hear from you. And uh, tell a friend, tell an enemy... Tell your food delivery driver that uh, you should be listening to this podcast where you're delivering uh, those tasty treats to all those uh, customers. That would be the tip for your driver. Also, you tip them a lot of money. Of course, yeah. Tip your drivers, question capitalism, and thank you for listening. Uh, for this week, I've been Annoyed Grunt Boy Steve. And I've been Annoyed Grunt Boy Craig. And remember, the greed of the most selfish will always squash any hope for a decent life for the rest of us. I'm getting an ulcer from all this lying. I'm an empath!